my channel. So before I dive into this case, I wanted to do a quick announcement. I know some of you probably know, some of you might not know because I've been a little bit secretive about it, which is very different for me because I've got quite the mouth on me. But thanks to the amazing, amazing work of John Lorden here on Lorden Arts, him and I both will be attending Crime Con this year in Nashville, Tennessee on May 4th to May 6th. Now, if you aren't aware of what Crime Con exactly is, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. There's Comic Con, there's a bunch of other different YouTube events that are held, and this is one based on the true crime experience. They have so many awesome things planned for this year. I know last year they had a bunch of amazing people. There will be Nancy Grace, The Vanished Podcast, True Crime Garage, so many awesome awesome people are going to this event. Not just content creators, there it will be a whole entire podcast row, which is where John and I will be. There are different well-known FBI agents and profilers. There's different search and rescue teams that usually come. If you stay at the hotel that it's specifically at, I know they do all sorts of random things, like you might just walk upon a crime scene or, um, you know, there's panels. It should be absolutely awesome. And I didn't even know this existed until someone subscribed to me mentioned it on Twitter and then John got in contact with me and basically asked if I would be interested in going. Now we'll just be on the podcaster row but you can come and talk to us, meet us, get some of our merch maybe, do a giveaway. We were planning a couple of other fun things along with this so I really really hope some of you guys will be there. If not and you would like to buy tickets I will have the link down below. I think it's $299 until the 28th. There are going to be so many amazing things. It's going to be such a great hands-on experience. It should be really, really fun. So thank you so much to John Lorden from Lorden Arts. You guys know I absolutely rave about his channel on my channel. I always do. I think he is one of the few people out there doing these videos, doing them for the right reasons. I look up to him when it comes to my videos. As a newer YouTuber in this genre, it's been kind of scary, especially growing at the rate that I did. And so I've always kind of gone to him when I need help or assistance. And he is just such an amazing, genuine person. I fangirled the entire time I was on his channel. It's just, it's been a crazy experience. This is one of the big things that I wanted to happen in 2018 and to uh, be able to go and accomplish this and be doing it beside the person that I probably look up to most in this YouTube community and this genre is pretty amazing. That being said, let's go ahead and jump right into today's video. And today I'm bringing you your favorite series back and that is Solved. You guys absolutely loved the Solved series, and it's something that I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. It had this particular case suggested quite a few times, and when I looked into it, I knew, especially because it kind of correlates to Saturday's video, that I had to cover it today, and that is the case of Irene Garza. Irene was born in 1934 to Nicholas and Josefina in McAllen, Texas. Now, she grew up in this southern area of McAllen, and eventually her family was able to work their way up into the more predominantly white and wealthier neighborhoods up north when their dry cleaning business really took off. Now this opened a lot of different opportunities for her. She became a beauty queen. She graduated from McAllen High School where she became the first Latina drum majorette. It was a huge accomplishment for her. She was the very first in her whole entire family to graduate from college. And then in 1958, she was crowned Miss All South Texas sweetheart in college. She became homecoming queen. She really went from a place where she was held down a lot because of the fact that she was a minority and she showed everybody that you can shoot through to the top despite that. And she was a huge inspiration to a lot of people and everyone was just amazed at her beauty and how incredibly kind she was. And unfortunately, this put her in a very bad position later on in life. When she graduated college, she became a teacher and she mainly taught disadvantaged children on the South Side, the place where she grew up, the place she called home for a good portion of her life. She was able to get out of that and so she wanted to do her best to give to those still in it. 
And despite being the center of attention frequently, she was actually very, very shy and she put a lot of weight on her shoulders, I guess you could say, because she was the first in her family to do a lot of the things that no one else had done and I think that started to weigh on her. So she started to really try to ground herself. She was Catholic and she believed so much in her faith and she really used that to guide her. She attended mass and communion every single day to make sure her faith was strong and would guide her through all of these different circumstances in life. And in particular, right before her disappearance, Holy Week was coming, which is the most sacred time of year for Catholics. Unfortunately, it became an absolute horror for not only her, but her family. She still lived with her mother and father and her sister. And on the night of April 16th, 1960, at 25 years old, Irene told her parents she was leaving to go to confession at Sacred Heart Church in McAllen. It was just a few minutes down the road and it was nothing out of the ordinary, so no one really thought anything of it. But unfortunately, Irene never made it back home. Her parents at first weren't too concerned. They believed she might have stayed behind for midnight mass. But when 3 a.m. rolled around and Irene had not returned home yet, they filed a missing persons report. Now, as I said before, she was a striking young woman. When she walked into a room, you noticed her. And because of this, a lot of people at the church that night did remember, in fact, seeing her. So she did make it to the church, but no one could really figure out what happened afterward. Two days later, on April 18th, little bits and pieces of Irene started showing up, stretching several hundred yards down McAllen Road. First, a purse was found, and then one of her shoes, then her lace veil, Obviously, from these strange bits of evidence stretching down an entire road, police started a search that would be the largest search to that date in Rio Grande Valley history. And this was the area that she was in at the time. Many tips started pouring in, and unfortunately, at the same time, they also received just as many scams. There was a woman who claimed to be Irene, said she was kidnapped and taken to a motel. There was a man at a diner who claimed that he was the one who killed her as an idea of a funny joke but every single one of those panned out to be nothing and instead just stabbed the hearts of Irene's parents over and over and over again. Then on April 21st, her parents' absolute worst nightmare came to life. Irene's body was unfortunately found in a canal. She was miles away from her belongings and the church that she last was seen in. She had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and suffocated. She had bruises on both eyes, on the entire right side of her face. And unfortunately, because she was thrown in water, any evidence that might have been on her body had been completely washed away. Police questioned 500 people across multiple different cities trying to find answers and they offered a $2,500 reward which is the largest that had been offered in the area at that time. They did almost 50 polygraphs and even some wealthy businessmen gathered up $10,000 to contribute to the reward money as well. They questioned co-workers, family, ex-boyfriends, any sex offenders in the area and everything interestingly enough led them to one person in specific and that was the very last last person who had ever spoken to Irene. Father John Fight was 27 years old at the time and he had been the one to hear Irene's confession the night of her brutal murder. Church members started coming forward and saying that Father Fight's confession line was moving particularly slow that night. And some people even said he left the sanctuary multiple times, which is not something that happens very often. To make things even stranger, when they drained the canal to look for any evidence, anything that might have been left behind, they ended up finding a photo slider. And John Fite himself sent a little note to police telling them that it belonged to him. So his own items just so happened to be at the scene of the murder, and he also was the last person to have spoken to her. A few fellow priests also came forward claiming that he had scratches on his hands when he finally showed back up for midnight mass that night. And some people even came forward saying that he had taken Irene to the church rectory, which from my knowledge is kind of like where the priests went for their personal chambers while they're inside of the church. And he took her there to hear a confession, which is not at all a common practice. The police department questioned him, gave him a polygraph test. According to them, he passed the test with flying colors, 
but that would later be revealed as untrue. Fight originally even denied having heard Irene's confession that night, but after so many people came forward and said 100% he was the one who heard a confession, we saw it, he eventually gave in and admitted to speaking to Irene that night. He excused his absence from the sanctuary by saying that his glasses had broken. He claimed since he was a newer priest and new to confessions that he was nervous a lot when he took these confessions, so he fidgeted with his glasses a little bit and he ended up breaking them. So he said because of that, he decided to go back to his pastoral house and get a new set of glasses. He said he realized when he got there that he left the key behind and he had to climb up the brick to the second story and break in the house that way. Way. That's also how he explained the scratches that he had all over him. But he was already in hot water because just weeks before, a woman named Maria was sexually assaulted in church not too far away. Rumors spread immediately that it was John Fight, and everyone said there was absolutely no way someone working for the church would never be able to commit such heinous crimes. We are against that. That is a sin. Absolutely not. So the attention was drug off of him. But after being put in a lineup in the same room as Maria, John Fight was picked out as the one who attacked her. When he first went to court about it, it ended up in a hung jury. And so he wouldn't face another trial. He entered a plea of no contest, which basically is like this weird limbo where you're not saying you're not guilty, you're not saying you're guilty. It's just this kind of in-between. And you usually only see this when it comes to plea deals, so they don't have to kind of pick a side. Um, but it's mainly linked to basically being guilty and knowing you have no other option. After being charged with Maria's assault and being the number one suspect from pretty much the entire town as well as the police department and whatever happened to Irene Garza, Fight was sent to Assumptions Abbey, which is a monastery. While spending time in this monastery, he actually admitted to Monk Tashini that he had killed one woman and hurt another and he asked for his counsel. Now, Tashini has said to this day that it wasn't his job to judge fight, that he was there to counsel him and he hoped he could teach him how to behave better towards women. So essentially, he had 100% admitted to this man what he did, but because he thought it wasn't his place to judge, it went unreported for years. After feeling uncomfortable with the monk's style, he was sent to Jabez Springs in New Mexico, and it was a treatment center for troubled priests. He somehow managed to work himself up to a supervisor position where he made a ton more horrific decisions. He ended up clearing a priest from this treatment that was known for molesting children, and he ended up sending him to another parish. Now, when he sent this man who was not okay, he was not treated of his sins, this man later ended up being in prison for molesting up to 100 children. So a fight at this point was just known as a man with an incredibly bad reputation. He had been linked to the sexual assault of one woman, linked to possibly the murder of another woman, and he basically gave the opportunity to another priest that was not okay to continue on with hurting these children. So in the 70s, he decided to leave priesthood and he got married and had a family. At this point, absolutely nothing had happened in Irene Garza's case, which was incredible. I mean, they knew that there was going to be no evidence left behind. She was found in a body of water. The chances of finding any sort of DNA on her of whoever attacked her was slim to none. And even so, at this point, DNA testing wasn't what it is today. Many possible witnesses died. Prosecutors and investigators changed and eventually her case just went cold. While this man that possibly did something and who was linked to the crime was running free, her family was suffering. Every single lead that they had just fizzled out. Everything led to nowhere. Every time they saw something that might have been an answer, somehow nothing came of it. It was just an incredibly infuriating case to follow, especially for the loved ones involved. And then finally in 2002, Tashni called 
authorities in San Antonio, Texas, thinking that is where this murder occurred. He said he could no longer keep John Fight's confession. After telling police what Fight had done, the investigation was finally reopened. Investigator Rudy Jamarillo contacted Priest O'Brien who had worked with Fight in the original church, and that's when he learned some very interesting information. Previously in 2000, O'Brien had been on a television show. He claimed to know absolutely nothing, but he opened up a lot more to Jamarillo, and he knew a lot more than he claimed he did. He told Jamarillo that he initially suspected fight for the murder. And he was proven right just a few days later after Irene was murdered. John Fight came to him and confessed everything. To add more to this pile of hidden confessions and truth that had been kept from her family and prevented her from having justice all these years, the polygraph examiner that had tested Fight originally in 1960 came forward as well and claimed that he had never actually passed the test. He had been said to have passed on documentation, but later down along the road, something in the document was changed that said it was inconclusive, but the man himself that administered the test said that he knew something was very wrong the entire time he was giving it. There were very bizarre results, and he believed strongly he had failed, but he was told by many people, oh no, it's fine, he passed. Now despite having three plus people coming forward claiming they heard actual confessions from Fight himself, District Attorney Guerra would not bring the case to court, at first at least. He was very hesitant. He said that O'Brien was suffering from dementia and he probably didn't know what he was saying. He said that Jamarillo had actually basically coerced Tashney into even calling in the first place since Tashney called the wrong city. He basically was in complete denial that anything was happening and said that there was no way there was enough evidence at all for them to prosecute Fight. Then in 2004, the case was brought to the grand jury and the grand jury decided to not indict Fight for the murder. So this closed things all over again. And then in 2005, O'Brien unfortunately passed away, which took away one of the only people who still could have fought to bring justice to Irene Garza and her family. District Attorney Guerra was, I mean, absolutely torn to shreds by people afterwards. He behaved horrifically. He said afterwards that who would be haunted by her death? She died and her killer got away. Like, so what? That's literally what he said. He didn't seem to care very much, didn't seem to think it was even worth the time solving, and just really dismissed it. So in 2014, District Judge Ricardo Rodriguez decided to try to unseat Guerra as district attorney, and he was successful. He vowed to everyone during his campaign that he would open up the Irene Garza case and put new eyes on it to hopefully finally solve this cold case after 50 plus years. Days after the election, Garrett tried to appoint him as a special prosecutor in the Garza case, but Rodriguez declined. He said that he wanted to wait until he was handed over the office and could look at things with fresh eyes. Finally, in April of 2015, yet again, Irene's case was reopened. And by February of 2016, Fight was arrested in Scottsdale, Arizona for the murder of Irene Garza. He was 83 at the time of his arrest. He used a walker. He had kidney and bladder cancer. He was held in the Hidalgo Adult Detention Facility and entered a plea of not guilty. Prosecutors requested a $750,000 bond, but defense protested right back at that, saying $100,000 tops because he has cancer. You can't do this to him. And the response to that was a $1 million bond instead. And the trial date was set for April of 2017. Fight's defense asked for a change in location of the trial literally the month it was supposed to start because they claim that their client would have no way of a fair trial in Hidalgo County because that is where everyone grew up hearing about the murder of Irene Garza. Ended up giving a 700 
page document saying all of the reporters in Hidalgo County had already painted him to be a murderer and that the only reason so far he had escaped all of this, you know, slander, <laughs> slander from the reporters was because the church protected him from it. May 24th, Judge Singletary heard the arguments to move the case and denied them. The trial ran from September 11th to December 7th when Fight was finally convicted for the murder of Irene Garza. The prosecution came forward with an insane amount of evidence showing that elected officials and church officials suspected that Fight had killed Irene the entire time but purposely avoided prosecution because it might harm the church's reputation. Now, it was a Catholic church, and at the time, many of the elected officials in the town were all Catholic, and in particular, the year it happened, John F. Kennedy was also running for president, and he was Catholic. 73-year-old Thomas Doyle was a Catholic priest and an expert in sexual assault and church law, and he actually read out a letter that had been taken via support Pina that had been sent in the time that all of this was happening. The letter was sent between clergy officials in October of 1960. It expressed concerns of a Catholic priest being charged with murder and how it would affect Kennedy's campaign and how it would affect the ability of a specific Catholic sheriff from being re-elected. A pastor at a church in Austin, Texas ended up sending a letter to the man who ran the church that Fight was in and told him he highly suggested that they hire a private investigator to find loopholes in the Fight case in case it went to trial basically. They were essentially all coming together as different Catholic churches and Catholic government officials to make sure they found every way possible around the conviction of one of their own priests. Pashney took the stand during the trial and even described in detail what exactly Fight said he did to Irene. He said he assaulted her, he gagged and bound her, and then put her in a bathtub and he ended up covering her head in cellophane, some sort of cellophane bag. And he said when he left the room, she said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Tashney says he remembers looking at Fight and saying, why are you here? Why are you not in prison? And Fight's response was, there are three things. The church helped me, law enforcement helped me, and I am saved by the seal of confession. All I could think about when I heard this was the Jabez Span case and the fact that there is a pastor protecting some sort of confession. And it makes me worry because I didn't know that these high up priests and pastors and, you know, members of any sort of church had so much protection. And you know, none of the people involved in this case were ever charged. And if it was just an average person, they would be considered an accessory to murder. So I think it's insane how much power the church itself has, especially when it comes to criminal activity and seeing this case and how many people work together. It's not just the church, it's whoever's a part of it. And that can mean elected officials, as we said before, which I find absolutely to be mad. A friend of Irene's came forward also in the trial and said that Irene had come to her just days before her murder and said that she didn't really enjoy going to confession anymore. It was just very different from what it used to be. She said that every time she went, Fight would come up to her and say, you're too good for this. Let's take you somewhere else to do your confession and drag her off to his rectory and say, oh, well, you'll be more comfortable here. More friends also came forward and said they had very strange encounters with Fight. There was one woman in particular who he approached and said, do you mind if I take photos of you dressed in all black in the cemetery? I mean, just really creepy and bizarre occurrences. And he kept just preying on these young and very, very beautiful women and taking advantage of them. And I think as someone in such a high power and someone that's looked up to so much, that is like the most disgusting 
thing in the entire world. Fight's attorney ended up asking for probation for him because of the fact that he had had no felony convictions in the time between Irene's murder and current day, and the prosecution said they at least asked for 57 years in prison because that was the amount of time that had passed since Irene's murder. Then on December 8th, kind of similar to the Bond situation, Fight was given life in prison. Prison. Irene's remaining family was in court on the day this happened and they were so incredibly overwhelmed and overjoyed that after even 57 years, after everyone usually gives up hope and just kind of stops trying, they finally had justice for their cousin. And that's something that they didn't think they would ever see. They had put up with so many things and now it kind of all started making sense. Even with the case closed, now so many people are coming forward, her family included, wondering how did this go unsolved for so long? How could elected officials have worked so closely with the church to make sure this sick, murderous man stayed out of prison for his crimes? Even though it's never fully been 100% proven, prosecutors still believe that the district attorney and the church leaders and the different elected officials, even throughout the years, have been cutting deals as the case was brought up again and as it was brought to light and reopened again, just to make sure the church didn't look bad. This case absolutely blew my mind because I feel like religion is so heavily relied on and it's thought to be this very innocent thing and I think because of that uh, you know a lot of people associated with religion feel this godly power and that's the best way that I can describe it to get away with whatever. I said it in the last video and I will say it again that I do not think there needs to be any special privilege when it comes to that. You guys commented a lot about the fact that most crimes you have to speak on and from my knowledge that's not true confession is a confession and each state can determine their laws on it when it comes down to it and the only one like i said across every single state that has to be enforced despite seal of confession is child abuse so i think that's nuts i found it so interesting that this case is just another prime example of what can happen because of that, all these people didn't think they needed to come forward because they weren't there to judge, because it's God's job to judge. But at the end of the day, we are human beings and we are the only ones here face to face and we should respect each other. I don't take this out of context. I'm not saying the Catholic Church is bad or any church is bad. I honestly respect any decision you make in any religion you follow. But I think that these excuses just kind of need to stop. And the fact that this happened 57, 50, almost 58 years ago, and I see something so similar happening in a case that just started a few months ago is disturbing, honestly. So let me know what you guys think down below. I hope you enjoyed today's solve video. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up button and hit that subscribe button to become a member of the family. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye.